St. Louis attorney Mark McCluskey was propelled into the national spotlight when a group of Antifa, Black Lives Matter types came storming into his neighborhood. Um, he and his wife, uh, feeling threatened, went for their weapons and they were seen on their front porch uh, brandishing these guns. Now, the media portrayed this as some kind of scandal. Scandal not on the part of the invasion of the neighborhood, but on the part of the McCloskeys. Uh, and now Mark McCloskey is running for the Senate in Missouri. Mark, welcome to the program. Thanks for joining me. Let me start with that fateful um, day when all those guys came into your neighborhood. Uh, Describe why you felt threatened enough to want to go for your firearms. Sure. Thanks for having me on the show. You know, uh, given the enormously dangerous, normal background violence in St. Louis, and then we added on top of it the uh, George Floyd incident, uh, where on June the 1st and June the 2nd of last year, uh, the mob burned down downtown St. Louis shot four police officers, killed a retired police captain and, and, and chief of the Moline Acres Police Department, David Dorn. Um, and these were just random rioters who broke into the, to the pawn shop where he was working secondary and killed him, live streamed it. And so these were, this was a violent mob that had proven itself to be dangerous and deadly. And then on the, um, June the 28th of last year, in the late afternoon, uh, three to 500 of them broke through my gate and stormed into my neighborhood, which is all a private neighborhood. It's, there's no public property here. The streets, the sidewalks, street lights, everything are owned by us. Breaking through that gate was a moment when, at least from my perspective, that protest stopped being peaceful and they started, be, they were trespassers. And I had every expectation that they would do to me that which they had done to downtown St. Louis and Captain Dora. And when you were standing there on the porch, uh, what was the sort of nature of the exchange between, if any, between you and those guys? Were they shouting threats or were they shouting slogans? What were they saying to you and your wife? Well, the first thing that happened was as soon as they broke down the gate and came in, I stood out on the porch and I said those two most hateful white supremacist words known to the English language. I said private property. And since they're communists, when I said private property, it inflamed them and they started rushing towards the house. My wife and daughter went in to call 911. I reached in and grabbed my AR-15. When I stepped out on the porch with a a rifle, the the chant was, we're gonna kill you, we're gonna rape your wife, we're gonna burn down your house, you've got a business, your business is gone, that's gonna be my bedroom, that's gonna be where I have my breakfast, that's gonna be where I take my shower after we kill you and take the house. And that that was the nature of the nonviolent protest, along with the people wearing body armor, and carrying weapons. When they did eventually get down to the mayor's house, they chased away a NBC affiliate with an AK-47 rifle. So that's how how peaceful this protest was. Mark, is it a fact that after all this happened, the uh, attorney general charged you and your wife with offenses? What were the charges? I mean, it seems to me this is an outrageous assault upon your property and on your neighborhood. Uh, and all you did was respond to that by essentially attempting to protect your castle, if I can use the that term. Um, what what would they possibly charge you with? And, and tell us a little bit about the prosecutor behind this. Sure. And, and not the attorney general, because the attorney general of the state's a Republican. He's one of my uh, adversaries in the Senate race. But it's our local circuit attorney. It's what we call our, our DA here is the circuit attorney. She's a George Soros funded uh, left wing extremist. She views her job as the prosecuting attorney to be social revolution rather than prosecuting crime. Um, she has this blacklist of officers who she considers racist. So she won't prosecute their arrests. Uh, they don't even know who they are. So that if you go out and arrest somebody, you don't know if the prosecutor is going to take that arrest or not. When they do get around to trying something, they're so incompetent, they lose over 50% of the cases they try. But they charged us with flourishing a deadly weapon, right? Um, we didn't put off a shot. We never left our own property. Every single, quote, protester, unquote, was standing on private property, and uh, none of them, nine of them eventually got charged with trespass, and those charges were dropped instantly. My wife and I, on the other hand, are still facing four years in prison and the loss of our licenses and our livelihood for doing nothing more than defending ourselves against a mob which had proven time and time again to be very, very dangerous. 
Mark, what about this? I mean, this very example that you give points to me to a larger double standard of justice. I mean, you've had these Antifa types. They burn St. John's Church in Washington. They've been assaulting Portland now for months. They set fire to the courthouse. They attack police officers. And I just contrast their fate with the January 6th protesters, because you have people who seem to be have done somewhat similar things, I would say in the Antifa case, more violent, and yet the January 6th protesters are sitting in solitary confinement, they're facing this kind of maximalist approach to being charged with all kinds of imaginable offenses, um, whereas the other guys are like catch and release. Uh, they, they are not prosecuted at all, or if they are, uh, they're let off with very light sentences. We even have the vice president of the United States, before she was vice president, funding the release of these mobsters from jail so they could get out and riot again the next day. It is such an upside down world. You know, the people sitting in solitary confinement now for months for doing no more than the people that broke into my neighborhood did trespass. None of those people spent, none of the people that broke into my neighborhood, threatened my life, have, sent, have spent a day in jail. And yet there are, I think the last time I heard something more than 36 people that have been in solitary confinement since January the 6th for doing no more than the same trespass and not breaking anything, unlike the people that broke into my neighborhood. So yeah, it's a totally upside down world. Let's talk about about running for the Senate. Uh, you, you've been a Republican. I assume you've been, uh, I don't know how involved you were in politics before, uh, either as an activist or as a donor, but something must have convinced you to sort of jump into this arena. Talk about that process. Talk about what your life was like before and what made you feel like now's the time for me to, um, to step up. Well, you know, if you'd asked me that question a year ago today, I'd have said that what I wanted most in the world was for the world to leave me the heck alone. I had a nice, pleasant life. I've, I've done pretty well for myself. But what I what I had no intention of doing was entering the public arena. But, you know, the world had another plan for me. And when those rioters broke into my neighborhood and then came back on July the 3rd with twice as many numbers and the specific intent to kill us and burn us out, um, uh, it just, we just made a commitment that there was something totally wrong with this world and that we needed to devote the rest of our lives to trying to fix it, to save our democracy. We uh, we had heard the president's speech at Mount Rushmore of the daylight on July the 4th, and he talked about combating Marxist extremism in this country. And the media portrayed that as a divisive speech. And my wife and I said, if combating Marxism in the United States is divisive, then there's something horribly wrong with our system, and we need to fix it if it takes, it takes us the rest of our lives. And so I've never, you know, I've never been a politician before, but that's what that's what caused me to make a commitment. Mark, let me ask you this. You've talked in some of your uh, comments that I've seen in the news about the fact that that our country is so divided and it is divided. Um, but the rioters who came into your neighborhood weren't random thugs. This wasn't a case of people who just said, OK, well, let's just go on a spree. Um, as you mentioned a moment ago, this is rioting that has friends in high places. Uh, there are powerful people in the media. There are powerful people in Hollywood. There are people in the Biden administration, maybe going all the way up to the vice president, if not the president himself. Of course, Joe Biden, who doesn't know a whole lot, but says that Antifa is just an idea, as if an idea came marching into your neighborhood. Um, my question is, is, are we facing in this country a serious threat of something we haven't, at least not in my lifetime, seen, which is not just the not just street violence, but street violence that is licensed with the approval of a major political party. I, I give you an example. The lady standing outside my gate on the second assault on July 3rd, chanting into the megaphone, you can't stop the revolution. That's Cori Bush. She's now the United States representative from the first district of Missouri. She's walking the halls of Congress. That woman who advocated the violent overthrow of our government had the gall to say on the floor of the House, no one who supports insurrection should be allowed in the halls of Congress, referring to our Senator Josh Hawley. Yet she's the only person I know in the halls of Congress that have, has actively advocated violent revolution. The other person that organized that event, this was an event um, started by an entity called Expect Us St. Louis. The heads are Cori Bush and a woman and a guy named Rashid Aldridge who's got elected to the Missouri legislature. So these are two people, communist revolutionaries, who are now elected officials, one to the United States government, one to our state government, 
And as I mentioned, we have the vice president of the United States who advocates for these revolutionaries. And we have Maxine Waters, who stands outside the courthouse in Minneapolis after a year of violence and murder and arson and looting, saying we have to be even more confrontational. These mobsters are like the brown shirts. They are the enforcement arm of the left. Do as we say, or we'll burn, we'll loot, and we'll kill. And that's what we're facing. Wow. Very, very insightful. Thank you, Mark McCloskey, for joining me. Best of luck with the Senate race. I know it's a little bit of a crowded field, but I know you'll stand out. Uh, and all the best to you. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me on.